Welcome to Conversations in North Dakota History. I'm Marsha Walter from the State Historical Society of North Dakota. Today we will be talking about the fiction film as artifact, and specifically we'll be discussing Northern Lights. We will be discussing this with Dr. Michael Anderegg, who is a professor of English at the University of North Dakota. He has degrees from the University of California, undergraduate degree, and a doctoral degree from Yale University. Welcome, Dr. Anderegg. Nice to be here. Northern Lights has achieved notoriety as an independent film about North Dakota created by North Dakota filmmakers. Can you provide some background for us about the production and distribution of the film and perhaps its general significance and impact? Yes, well, the, uh, the background uh, in terms of its production, of course, it's an independent film, which means that uh, it was uh, produced outside the usual uh, structures of, uh, of uh, commercial filmmaking, Hollywood, and so forth. It was uh, produced because, uh, primarily, two young men, John Hansen and Rob Nielsen, wanted to, uh, to make the film. They both had uh, roots in North Dakota, and um, even though they had uh, gone to school elsewhere and, had, had, and were living in, in, in San Francisco, they wanted to do something that, that connected them back to their North Dakota heritage. And also, they wanted to, in a sense, uh, uh, tell the rest of the world something about North Dakota. And what this meant, originally they, they had planned to do a documentary on uh, the, the Nonpartisan League, which uh, becomes the, the background to the to final film. And for this, they, um, they asked for money from the North Dakota Humanities Council. And uh, they were granted uh, uh, money to make a, a half-hour documentary. But as they started working on the project more, they began to realize that, um, that it would be more interesting from their point of view to make a fiction film. So they um, asked the uh, North Dakota Humanities Council for more money to uh, make a longer film and to make a fiction film, uh, a film using actors and uh, uh, with a script and, uh, and all the various other uh, production uh, details that were necessary. And uh, the North Dakota Humanities Council agreed to fund this if they first uh, did the documentary. So they produced a documentary called Prairie Fire, which is about the, uh, the uh, nonpartisan league, and is produced mainly using still photographs and some uh, film footage. And uh, uh, it's an interesting documentary, and in a sense, it serves as a kind of introductory background to the final, to the final film. And after they made that, then they, they um, uh, went back to their original idea of doing a, a fiction film. And uh, the film ended up costing around $300,000. Uh, much of that money came from the Humanities Council. Uh, other um, uh, funds were raised uh, elsewhere. But basically, that, that's how the, the film got financed. And, uh, it's important to realize, of course, that even in 1978, when the film was, uh, was completed, that uh, the average Hollywood feature film would cost around 10 to 12 million dollars. Uh, today, it's it's more like 15 to 16 million dollars. So, uh, 300 thousand dollars is uh, you know is obviously a drop in the bucket compared to uh, what it costs to make a, a full-fledged Hollywood production. And I think that's something that has to be kept in mind when people uh, watch the film and uh, and understand that that's part of the. Uh, the necessary production background. In any case, having um, gotten the money and uh, uh, at least having gotten the promise of it and having gotten some uh, other financing, they began uh, filming and they worked out a script. They had a little film company in San Francisco and they used that as a kind of base for their, uh, uh, their operations. But of course, the film was made, at least the exteriors uh, were filmed uh, in and around uh, Crosby, North Dakota. And um, over a couple of winters, uh, they had to photograph for a while, and then they had to uh, go back to San Francisco, and then they came back and photographed again the following winter uh, when they had more money. And uh, they hired uh, some professional actors, very few of them, for some of the minor, uh, for the major roles, and then for the minor roles, uh, for secondary roles, they used uh, 
uh, local uh, area people in North Dakota and, and, and in Crosby and, and around uh, that area. And so it, uh, you know, it, and they filmed under rather difficult conditions. Having chosen to do it in the wintertime, uh, it meant that uh, uh, things would happen, like the cameras would, uh, would freeze up and, and other matters of that kind. The weather was, of course, unpredictable. And, uh, you know, there was some um, difficulties, like just matching a shot filmed one winter with, uh, with uh, a shot filmed the next winter in the same location. And supposedly it's the same time, uh, but the weather might be different. So they had to work around a lot of, uh, of interesting technical uh, details to, uh, to work out the film. Um, and some of what happened in the course of filming was uh, fortuitous, like the, uh, the blizzard that uh, occurs during a, uh, um, a threshing scene. And uh, that wasn't planned, obviously, and it turned out to be a, a, a godsend because it, it makes the scene that much more dramatic. But uh, that's the kind of thing that they just had to, uh, to be ready for. In any case, the film was uh, completed in uh, in '78, and being a, a 60, it was filmed in 16 millimeter. Now, most all commercial films are filmed in in 35 millimeter, um, and that's how that's the kind of, of uh, projection equipment movie theaters have, and so forth. So, in order to distribute a film uh, to regular movie theaters, you have to have it in 35 millimeter which means in this case they had to have their film blown up from 16 to 35 millimeter. And usually what happens is when a film is blown up from 16 to 35, the quality of the image deteriorates. Uh, in this case, however, the photography was so good, and the uh, uh, plus the fact that they wanted it to look a little bit grainy anyway to give it a sense of historical past, those two things combined meant that the 35 millimeter print looked, looked pretty good. Having that, then they needed to try to distribute the film, and that's a very difficult thing to do. The Hollywood studios, of course, have their own uh, distribution arms and, and, and companies that get the films to movie theaters, get them out uh, to various parts of the country and the world. Uh, if you're an independent film producer, however, you don't have all of that uh, structure, so you have to do it yourself. And uh, that's a very difficult, time-consuming um, task, just to get people to uh, agree to show your film, uh, very difficult. Particularly when, in this case, it's a low-budget, independent film about North Dakota. Uh, you know, the, the filmmakers quite naturally realized that this was not, on the face of it, the most appealing uh, uh, type of subject in the world. But um, they nevertheless set about to distribute the film. And they did it really in a, in a, in a kind of uh, step-by-step -step way. They premiered the film in Crosby, North Dakota, where it had been mostly filmed. Then they um, managed to talk uh, theaters in places like Grand Forks and Bismarck into a one-week or, if possible, two-week, three-week runs in those, those cities. And, um, and then they tried to get it into uh, in Minneapolis. In other words, they started very small and sort of worked their way, uh, their way up, which is sort of the opposite of the way most films are distributed, which is that particularly uh, in this period, in the 70s, uh, a film would, be, would open in New York and uh, Los Angeles and Chicago, and then would go down you know, eventually over to the uh, smaller cities and towns and so forth, work its way down. This film, they, they basically worked, it, it worked its way up from Crosby. Uh, and, but they weren't getting very far outside of the region. Um, uh, and what helped them finally sort of break out of that was, was being invited to a, a festival, a film festival in uh, Belgrade, Yugoslavia, of all places. Uh, someone had, had seen it or heard about it, had been interested in it, and invited them to show it at this festival. And um, that festival had a kind of you know, European base with different uh, film uh, producers, distributors, television distributors coming to, to the festival and seeing uh, the, the films that were exhibited there. And they, Northern Lights was shown there and uh, won some awards. And the uh, television distributors from various European countries uh, were interested in the film. And so they bought the rights to show on television. And having won that award or having had that exposure in Europe, then the film became more appealing in the United States. So it got some more bookings. Uh, places like Seattle and, and, and so forth. Uh, again, it still hadn't gone to, uh, to New York or to any of the major, major cities. And after a little bit more distribution in this country, then it was invited to the Cannes Film Festival in, in France, which is one of the major, uh, one of the oldest and one of the most uh, 
I wouldn't say distinguished necessarily, but famous film festivals in the world. They can't be too distinguished since it depends a lot on, on commercialism. And uh, uh, it is actually a kind of trade uh, fair, a huge trade fair for movies. Nevertheless, the fact that Northern Lights was invited to be shown in that festival was quite a, a coup, and it received international attention as a result. And uh, the very fact that it was invited was uh, you know, written up in, in the press and variety and places like that where um, uh, distributors read about it. So uh, it went to Cannes and, uh, in the uh, spring of uh, 79, and it turned out to win uh, one of the major awards, which in this case is the, what's called the Camera d'Or, the Golden Camera Award for Best First Feature, uh, for Best Film um, Made by First Time Filmmakers. And that gave it a lot of international uh, uh, attention, and, and um, people began to, to, to pay more attention to it, both in Europe and, again, in the United States. It, uh, it received more television uh, sales in Europe and uh, received more bookings in the United States. And so eventually it did get uh, shown finally in, in New York and, and Boston and places like that and ran for a while and, uh, and was surrounded by a certain uh, aura of, uh, of fame and it was well received by the press both nationally and internationally. I mean, it, it never became a blockbuster movie, uh, but uh, for obvious reasons, I think, but it, uh, it did get some kind of distribution and, and, and notice uh, throughout the country. And uh, that's basically the background of the film in mm -hmm. terms of its production and distribution. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, there seem to be a, a growing number of feature films in recent years which document regional American culture. How do you explain this phenomenon? Um, is this a growing trend, and, and also do they provide adequate documentation of, of regional culture? Well, I think, yes, uh, that was certainly true in the, uh, perhaps at the end of the 70s, early 80s, uh, there were a number of, of uh, big budget commercial films dealing with, uh, the, with the, the farm crisis, as it was called. And I think that what that indicates is that uh, Hollywood is sensitive, uh, and, the, and the film industry in general is sensitive to um, particular social political issues of a given moment, and uh, uh, the period of the of the early 80s was one of uh, considerable uh, uh, where considerable attention was being paid to uh, rural problems and rural life, and Hollywood sort of jumped onto that bandwagon for a while. But uh, that's already pretty much dissipated, and and I think it simply reflects historical realities in the 1930s. Uh, when the uh, the depression uh, uh, was uh, you know in everyone's mind, uh, Hollywood also made movies, a uh, few anyway, uh, that dealt with uh, with rural issues and with the depression. So I think it, it's simply that Hollywood follows uh, and filmmakers follow uh, whatever seems to be of of interest uh, at the particular moment. And whenever they make uh, one film on a particular topic, if that film uh, uh, is successful, then they make several more, and uh, often those films aren't as successful, and the whole thing dies out until the next uh, the next hot thing comes along. So, I wouldn't put too much uh, uh, emphasis on that uh, that kind of uh, of attention from Hollywood. As far as whether it's accurate or not, uh, you know, the, these films are commercial products. They're meant to be uh, entertaining. They're meant to appeal to a wide range of, of viewers, and. Uh, that uh, automatically compromises uh, uh, any kind of uh, a thoroughgoing uh, uh, accuracy, I suppose. But on the other hand, the films draw attention to the problems that they're dealing with. And uh, several of the films that came out uh, were uh, certainly made honest attempts to, to deal with uh, some of the issues of, uh, of uh, rural life and farming. And uh, so I think that, that was valuable because it, it uh, uh, you know, call people's attention to that issue, people who wouldn't otherwise uh, care very much. And, uh, but any, you know, any film, insofar as it's a, uh, uh, an aesthetic construct, is bound to um, distort reality and should uh, in order to, to be a fiction and to be a, 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 an artwork. Uh, uh, no artwork is an exact reproduction of reality. If it were, then it wouldn't be an artwork anymore. It would just be reality, which is another matter. So. Um, I think it was it was interesting that uh, a number of these films came out, and in a way, Northern Lights could be seen as, in its own small way, having uh, set off a kind of uh, of uh, mini uh, uh, series of uh, of films on on rural topics. I think. 
What about the, at least there seem to be more attempts to film on location in, in various regions of the country. Does, does that hold any truth? That, yes. That uh, Hollywood is doing that sort of thing. Oh, yes, I think mm -hmm. so. And that, of course, has been true uh, for some time now. In a way, it's, uh, it's actually self-serving because it's in many ways a lot cheaper to film on location at certain parts of the country uh, than it is to film in Los Angeles. And uh, so there's a certain advantage. I mean, uh, it's more difficult and more time consuming. So in that sense, it can be sometimes more uh, expensive on the one hand. But on the other hand, uh, you're not dealing with uh, the same kind of uh, union problems and issues of that nature. So often, uh, Hollywood filmmakers like to get away from uh, uh, from Hollywood. In fact, they like to get away from the United States. They go to Canada frequently and, and film there because it's cheaper. And uh, so I think that's it's not so much a desire for accuracy, although that's part of it, uh, but it's also a desire to, uh, to save money. But, uh, you know, people expect more and more to see films that are on location. Uh, ever since probably the 50s, really, it has been that trend going on. Um, getting back to Northern Lights mm -hmm. specifically and uh, this independent film genre. Uh, documentary film is a genre which of course is invaluable for historians. What about the fiction film? How can it serve an, as a historical document? Uh, does the film as artifact interpret history mm -hmm. just as our artifacts in the museum setting do? Mm -hmm. Well, I think they do. I, I think in order to, um, to see how they do that, however, you have to sort of interpret, uh, you have to define history in a particular way. Um, that is, every film, in a sense, is, uh, is a product of history, in the sense that it comes out of a particular historical moment. Uh, and whether that is a Hollywood film or any other kind of film, uh, the, and, wh and whatever the topic or the subject of the film, it is bound to reflect the, the, re the historical and social and economic realities of the moment in which it's made. And I think that uh, a film like Northern Lights very clearly, you know, although it's ostensibly about 1915-1916 um, period and the rise of the Nonpartisan League, uh, it's also, to me, to my mind, uh, equally about uh, the 1970s and, uh, and the late 1960s because the film reflects the attitudes and the uh, expectations and the beliefs of people who grew up, who came of age, who, uh, and, and I know this is, you know, uh, literally true about uh, uh, Hansen and Nielsen and some of the other people involved in the film, uh, who were very much caught up in the, in the turmoil of the 60s. and. Uh, and this carried over into their attitudes in the 70s. So uh, for a historian of the future, uh, studying a film like Northern Lights, what the historian would probably be more concerned about than, let's say, the Nonpartisan League would be uh, the film as a reflection of certain attitudes of the 1970s. Uh, and uh, so in that sense, um, if, you, if you use history in a broad sense, I think all fiction films, even ones that seem to, to have nothing to do with history per se, uh, uh, fantasy, you know, Star Wars, let's say. Uh, Star Wars is a good example because Star Wars is actually very much about uh, the, uh, the mid-70s. It's about uh, a period uh, where, um, for whatever reason, uh, there was a, a return to certain kinds of simplistic values of good, you know, attitudes towards good and evil and bad guys and good guys, and that reflects certain political attitudes of the period. Uh, so that someone looking at Star Wars, you know, again, uh, 50 years from now, would see it as a certain product of, uh, of a certain period in American history and culture, and as reflecting uh, in a disguised way and in an unintentional way, perhaps, uh, many of the attitudes and feelings uh, and uh, you know, um, uh, political issues of, of the period. Uh, so uh, a film, even a fiction film, even a romantic comedy or whatever, uh, says something, in fact, particularly a romantic comedy, will say a lot about uh, sexual politics and about how people uh, uh, regard, um, uh, you know, interpersonal relationships in a particular period. Uh, I just saw the film Parenthood recently, which uh, clearly says a lot about, uh, about uh, yuppie life and anxieties about child raising in 1989. Uh, uh, I mean, that's, that's, there's no doubt that the film is therefore reflecting, even in a comic way and, and in some cases an unintentional way, uh, much of, of the historical reality of, of the period we're living in now.
do you think that that historians are beginning to use film in this way and in, in the way they think about uh, a film for example yes I think they are I think that's a fairly recent phenomenon yeah. but uh, certainly in the last uh, few years historians have looked at uh, particularly cultural historians have looked at fiction films uh, throughout the whole history of film from the late 19th century when, when motion picture began uh, as having a, uh, being a valuable artifact in the uh, the study of, of, uh, of how people live and, and what they think and what they feel in any particular time. So uh, uh, there's no doubt that historians are beginning to see that, uh, that films can be used as, uh, you know, as any other kind of uh, a found object that, uh, that if studied properly and if looked at in the right way can tell you something about what's going on in, in the period in which that object was created. Um, yeah, I think that's true. The filmmakers in Northern Lights have tried to balance mm. fiction and history. You have suggested that uh, they have downplayed the historical context. Is there greater risk in fictionalizing historical subjects on film and more so than, than with the historical novel, for example? Um, more, more opportunity in film for propaganda or for it to be seen as propaganda? Sort of a lot of questions yes. for you well, uh, <laughs> to deal with. There are a number of issues here. Um, in, in a way, uh, the historical novel, for example, uh, historical novels tend to be very long. I think one reason they tend to be very long is because the authors uh, do try to get in as much historical background and texture as possible to their fictional situation. And that's, to a lot of people, that's what's fun about historical novels, is the sense that they're also learning something at the same time as they're enjoying uh, uh, a kind of typical uh, uh, fictional construct, a love story, romance, whatever. Um, and, and, and traditionally, historical novels have, have, have had a lot of sex and violence. Uh, together with, you know, at the same time you're learning something, and people uh, enjoy uh, enjoy that combination. I think a lot. In, in a film, you can't really be quite as expansive as you can in a novel. And um, and in a fiction film, um, I mean, I'm not. I would suggest that that the makers of Northern Lights made a deliberate decision not to enter into the details of the nonpartisan league, or even the philosophy, uh, the impetuses behind the formation of the nonpartisan league, uh, they could have done more with that. And they could have done more and still kept it a fictional, a fictional film. Um, I mean, by definition, almost any film is going to be fictional anyway. It has to be a reconstruction of a particular historical moment. It can't be that historical moment. Um, I think, in a way, what the makers of Northern Lights have done, uh, at least to a certain extent, is followed a kind of model of Hollywood filmmaking. When Hollywood deals with historical subjects, it tends to, and particularly politics, which it usually stays away from, actually, but whenever it does, uh, it tends, nevertheless, to shift the emphasis to the, the personal as opposed to the political. In other words, what happens is that the personal the, the political issues become personal issues. And um, what starts out at the beginning of a, of a film as a political conflict will very soon resolve itself into a personal conflict, which is then solved at the personal level, and, and which leaves the political sort of uh, behind, in a way, or as a secondary issue. In Northern Lights, I think the filmmakers did a nice job of balancing those two aspects. That is, they did not simply uh, um, turn to the personal and, and allow that to, be, uh, to become the central focus. They, they managed to shift back and forth throughout uh, on the, the, um, between issues having to do with, with politics and political organization and the issues having to do with uh, family relationships and, uh, and romance and, and so forth. And uh, uh, I think that is a... Um, was a good strategy. Uh, I don't think it's it's uh, necessarily wrong that we don't know more about the nonpartisan league uh, as a result of watching the film. Because you don't really learn history from watching films. You learn attitudes a bit about history, perhaps, but you're not going to get the nitty gritty details, and you shouldn't. You know, you should go elsewhere for that. That's what you're interested in. Um, in fact, I think a film like Northern Lights, uh, one of its major uh, values, in a way, is that it sends people back to history, that, it's, uh, that it arouses their curiosity, or should, about a period in North Dakota history that people don't know very much about. Uh, 
And uh, after you've seen the film, I think what you ought to be feeling, in, in, on the one hand, is, gee, I'd like to know more about this. I'd like to know what really happened. I'd like to know what the consequences of this was. I'd like to know more about North Dakota's socialist uh, heritage and roots. Uh, and then you go to books. You know, uh, you go to other kinds of documents and artifacts. Uh, what a film like Northern Lights will tell you is not so much what happened in 1915, 1916, but rather uh, what the attitude of uh, certain filmmakers in the 1970s was about what happened in 1915, 1916, and how valuable they found it, and what meaning they found in those events. Because any film, uh, any work of art, really, has to be about the moment, the present moment. You know. Uh, it has to be first and foremost, really, about life today, uh, no matter how you know, it may be ostensibly dealing with life in the past. And um, so I think that's the, the real historical issue in the film, is what it tells us about uh, issues in the 70s in relation to uh, past issues. What about the role of Henry Martinson, the, the charming 94-year-old mm. North Dakotan uh, fe featured in the film? Can audiences bridge the gap uh, between true documentary uh, coverage and then the, the narrative fiction again? Is this appropriate? Uh, is it innovative, if you could comment on that? Yes, I, I certainly think it is innovative. I think it's also, however, probably uh, for a lot of viewers, confusing. Uh, the film does begin with, with uh, uh, in a sense, with a documentary. Uh, it, it photographs uh, Henry Martinson uh, uh, driving a car and then uh, entering his, uh, his apartment. And, uh, and in the meantime, we hear in voiceover him uh, reflecting something that at least seems to be uh, something about his own past and, and how he, uh, uh, when he went into farming and, and, and so forth and so on. Although uh, we're not given the fact that the film turns into fiction very quickly thereafter, it's, in retrospect, we're not sure that anything he actually says is necessarily true. Uh, the dialogue that he's given to, to speak, in other words, it's very hard to tell. And I think that's part of the confusion. Uh, Henry Martinson really was a socialist and is, uh, at least was until his death. He, um, he uh, was involved with the Nonpartisan League, at least in a, in, a, uh, in a marginal sort of way. And uh, even though the Nonpartisan League was not part of the socialist uh, program per se, uh, he had something to do with, with that. Uh, he got involved in it. He is himself a kind of historical artifact, you know, uh, as, as it's presented in the film. And um, I think that, that it's a little disconcerting to have his narration very quickly become uh, um, the pretense of a fictional story. That is, he begins to talk about how he knew Ray Sorensen back in the old days, and then we get into the story of Ray Sorensen. We show Henry uh, Martinson uh, typing up this, this uh, memoir, basically. And of course, Ray Sorensen is a fictional character. And, uh, and uh, uh, so th it is a little disconcerting, I suppose, although, um, as I say, it, it depends. If you know anything about uh, Henry Martinson uh, already, when you're watching the film, you might be more disconcerted than if you don't. Uh, it might not be uh, obvious to you that the film shifts from, uh, from a documentary reality to a fictional story uh, as you're watching it. Uh, so it depends really on how much you already, you already know. But what they tried to do was to meld the historical with the fictional. They tried to have the, the moment at which the film shifts from documentary to fiction almost imperceptible. Uh, it really happens in the middle of Henry Martinson's narrative. Uh, and uh, it, I suppose it happens when he sits down on the typewriter and begins to type, because uh, he's not really writing a memoir about Ray Sorensen. Uh, he's just pretending. You know? so, uh, and of course, in real life, we often do things that are pretend also. So whether, it's, you know, uh, whether that's a violation of uh, documentary reality or not is an open question. Um, certainly, their use of Henry Martinson as a kind of um, bookend for the film, really, bookends, uh, he appears at the beginning and then he comes back through at the end, uh, is one of the most appealing aspects of the film, as far as I'm concerned, partly because Henry Martinson's personality shines through so vividly in those scenes in which he appears. Uh, his spirit is so uh, attractive and appealing that it's a pleasure to, to see him, and I think it makes it makes the history of 1915-16 come to life in a way more vividly than anything we, uh, else we see in the film because uh, 
we know that he lived it and his enthusiasm for uh, life and for his past and so forth uh, comes through very strongly in the course of the film and, and gives it a validity that it might not otherwise have, I think. North Dakotans sometimes find Northern Lights depressing for the image of the state it projects, uh, alcoholism, drab views of the landscape. Uh, what reactions do you have? Yes, well, um, of course, I mean, one could answer that that is simply an accurate picture of the state, but uh, um, that, would be, that would be to say that it's only an accurate picture, perhaps, of, uh, of certain aspects of the state. Uh, seriously, I think the, the filmmakers perhaps um, went a little overboard in stressing the, the wintry aspect of North Dakota. I mean, there are other seasons here. Some people uh, jokingly say that they, don't, you know, they only last for a week or so each, but actually that's not true. Uh, North Dakota summers, for example, are generally quite pleasant, and, uh, uh, and they do last for more than a week or so. But, um, you know, that's, in a way, that's a kind of artistic license. I mean, uh, given that they're trying to present an image of a of a hard life. I mean, that's really what they're trying to suggest, that life is difficult for these farmers. And it was difficult. It doesn't matter whether it was the summertime or the wintertime. Uh, life was difficult. And from an aesthetic point of view, uh, it, it simply reinforces that to have it seem as if life is all, is all wintertime. Um, so <clears throat> I'm not sure that that's a, you know, that, that's an artistic aesthetic choice that they made. And uh, the film wasn't made as a, as a uh, you know, as propaganda for the, uh, the travel uh, commission. Uh, it wasn't meant to, uh, to get people to come to North Dakota. Uh, so I don't think that that's a, uh, necessarily a valid uh, uh, criticism of the film. Mm -hmm. um, it, it creates a certain mood, and, and they want to sustain that mood throughout, and they do it by, uh, by having it mostly seem like it's the winter time. I mean, actually, it isn't always this. You don't see uh, that much snow, actually. But uh, it, it does look bleak. And, and the landscape of much of North Dakota is bleak. I mean, it's, uh, there's no question. And the part of North Dakota they chose to film it in is, is uh, particularly northern and, uh, and particularly bleak. But uh, uh, it represents a truth about that particular area. And uh, they had no obligation to, to show other aspects of, uh, of North Dakota life, necessarily. Uh, as far as the alcoholism is, or the drinking, I mean, it's, there's some alcoholism, I suppose, and just some drinking in the film. Again, I think that's something that perhaps North Dakotans are especially sensitive to because I think other people don't notice it, uh, interestingly. I mean, I, I've talked to people who've seen the film and, and mentioned the fact that uh, um, occasionally when I've shown the film, say, to a, a, a class, uh, one of the first comments somebody will make is, is about the drinking and how much of it there is. Um, so I think that's perhaps something that North Dakotans are sensitive to. And, and, the, and, and again, it's a little bit of embarrassment that that image has been presented perhaps to the rest of the world. I think the drinking in the film is used again as, as a way of suggesting the hardness of the life, you know, the, the, the difficulties of, of coping with everyday activities. And one of the things that a socialist might argue, or that uh, a Marxist might argue, or that uh, uh, someone with a uh, political conscience and concern for uh, the quality of life might argue, is that, uh, is that what leads people to drink um, is being exploited, uh, is being uh, living a life that uh, doesn't present them with the rewards that, uh, that ought to come to them, is uh, uh, living a hard life that has few, uh, a few uh, spiritual or other kinds of rewards, and that uh, at a certain period in American history, uh, the the nature of capitalism was such that it drove people to that kind of life. That it uh, that people were exploited, and one response to exploitation is to seek s uh, solace and things like drink. So. Uh, I think that, too, had a kind of thematic import in the course of the film. Uh, but, you know, it has to be said that not everybody in North Dakota drinks or did drink in this period, and that uh, uh, a lot of North Dakotans and, and, and the people of Norwegian and Swedish and other uh, backgrounds came from very strict uh, uh, um, backgrounds where drinking was uh, non-existent. So uh, it's, a, it's a fair statement to make that the, the film is not presenting an accurate view of all North Dakotans. Uh, again, there's a certain kind of artistic license involved, I think.
um, juxtaposed with the depressing elements of life on the plains, there's some very exhilarating moments in the in the film. I'm wondering yes. if you could comment on on some of those the playful scenes between Inga and Ray. The uh, uh, of course the the last scene with uh, the mm -hmm. real North Dakotan mm -hmm. with Henry Martin. Yes, Henry Martin. actually. What would you how would you interpret? Yeah, I, first of all, I don't think the film is depressing to me. I mean, I think that's a uh, that's simply to to look at the uh, perhaps even just the, the the visual presentation of landscape. Uh, the film, it seems to me, has a very optimistic thrust to it, uh, and uh, and the ending, although it's a mixed ending, it's a, it's an ending that leaves you up in the air about certain things, and by that I mean the ending of the fictional story proper, where Ray is uh, where the NPL has won the the primaries. Uh, and is looking forward to victory in the uh, in the general election. Uh, Ray is going to continue uh, his activities to help bring that about. Uh, it's 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 the film very clearly indicates that that they are going to win, and historically, of course, uh, they did. Uh, that's very positive and very optimistic. On the other hand, the relationship between Ray and Inga, which um, uh, is 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 part of the central fictional aspect of the film. Uh, is left sort of up in the air, uh, whether they're going to get married finally, whether they're going to be able to settle down and have a family and so forth, uh, is somewhat questionable because of, the, of Ray's uh, uh, absences, because of the fact that he is gone so much, because he is uh, off uh, recruiting and, uh, and proselytizing for the, uh, the nonpartisan league. Uh, and there's a suggestion there that somehow this interferes, this will, this will not allow for a kind of romantic resolution that, uh, uh, that we usually like in, uh, in uh, our love stories. But I think that uh, is, is balanced nicely with the sense of, of, of communal victory and of a communal activity. So I, and I think the, the moments in the, in the film, the threshing uh, scene, the, uh, uh, there are other moments in the film that, that stress a communal um, accomplishment and, and communal victories, and I think that is very positive. So I don't find the film uh, depressing uh, in its final effect. I think what's perhaps depressing uh, is the realization that we have after seeing the film that in spite of the fact that nonpartisan lean won, in spite of, uh, uh, of some changes, uh, that much remains the same, uh, that the, the lot of the North Dakota farmer uh, the, the average family farmer is, is maybe not as harsh and as difficult as it was in 1915-16, but uh, the farmer is still, uh, um, is still, at least in potential, uh, exploited, is still has a difficult time making ends meet, is still uh, finding uh, the, the, uh, the ability to keep and hold on to uh, what he and she has uh, difficult. So uh, that reflection might be a depressing one, uh, that things don't necessarily get a lot better as time goes on. But otherwise, I think the film leaves you with a, with a positive feeling. The most serious criticism of Northern Lights is that it doesn't represent an accurate portrayal of, of women living on the mm -hmm. plains. Uh, do you have comments in terms of, of indeed it being an art form, the film, rather than a historical document? Yes. Well, there's several aspects of that. I'm not a historian, and I don't really know uh, how accurate or inaccurate the picture is, although I have read evidence that, that, uh, that I think is very uh, incontrovertible that that women were involved with uh, league activities, for example, that they did take an active role in political issues. And, and I think just uh, you know, common sense reflection will tell you that that's always been the case, that there have always been women who have taken part in uh, political and other activities. And so I think the film tends to downplay that. Um, and I think that's unfortunate. Uh, again, the film doesn't have, I don't think any work of art has any obligation to be necessarily true to every detail of historical reality or to any detail of historical reality. At the same time, however, since the film is, in a sense, a kind of semi-documentary, since it's pretending to be telling you uh, uh, about certain historical events, since the filmmakers themselves have, uh, have argued that they are presenting a kind of historical reality, then, when it, then one has, a, I think, the obligation to, to question how uh, 
historically accurate and why certain things are accurate and other things are not. Uh, again, you know, uh, it's not a moral issue. They don't have that particular obligation, but it's an interesting question. And uh, when the filmmakers have been challenged on the issue of their presentation of women, they have tended to say, well, we're just presenting the things the way they actually were, you know, and this was the way life was in the prairie in 1915, 16. Women stayed at home and did the cooking and so forth and so on. Well, that just won't wash because, first of all, even if that were true, uh, there are other parts in the film where they distort the way things were. They don't uh, show everything accurately in terms of history. And if they don't show other things accurately in terms of history, why were they so concerned to show this aspect accurately in terms of history? That's a very uh, weak argument. Uh, a better argument would be to say that given their interest in showing the tension that develops between, on the one hand, a desire for political activity, for communal activity, and on the other hand, uh, the values of home and family and domesticity, that following a, a long uh, a tradition uh, and, and also, I suppose, playing up to the expectations of most people in an audience, that men are, tend to be those who are the the active, uh, uh, politically involved uh, seekers, and women tend to be the passive uh, people who h uphold the values of domesticity and, and home life and, and romance. And that's the way it's been in, in Hollywood films, certainly, uh, 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 always. And therefore, they're, uh, they're, they're taking that, that convenient uh, way of, of dealing with it. I think that that actually they're aware of the difficulty in the film. I think they try to uh, balance that issue by having Inga, particularly near the end of the film, in the, in the moment when she has a, a long monologue about life uh, uh, in, as a child in, in, in wintertime in North Dakota, where she talks about how her father would, as soon as the, the farming uh, season was over, would, uh, would go off and uh, sell books door to door and leave the family uh, during the winter. And she's very uh, bitter about that. And on the one hand, of course, that simply reinforces the idea that women somehow need to have men around and, and, the, and that men uh, can't stand to be uh, uh, cooped up uh, in a family domestic situation. So uh, that's the cliche that she's playing, that the, the monologue is in part playing into. But on the other hand, the, the, the power of her bitterness in that scene and the strength with which she expresses it uh, suggest a kind that, that she's rebelling against something more than just the fact that her father left every winter, that she's rebelling to some extent against the, the condition, uh, the social condition that puts men and women in these roles, and that, that women are, are, are therefore not capable. I mean, part of the, the difficulty that she talks about is how uh, things would get broken and wouldn't get fixed. Well, you could argue that women ought to be able to fix things that get broken, uh, you know, that it's not necessary for them to depend on men. And I think part of what her, her monologue, and, and, and it's very well delivered, I think, by the actress uh, Susan Lynch, it's one of the best uh, moments in the film, uh, that she is partly angry, not just about her father's departures, but about the state uh, of being a woman and having to depend so much on men uh, when it shouldn't be necessary. Uh, so I think in that scene, there's a kind of almost uh, uh, awareness. If not, if the filmmakers maybe weren't totally conscious of it, it comes out, I think, in a, a kind of subtext in the film that, uh, that they're aware of, the, of the, the gender problem, I think, in the film. What about the visual imagery in the film? You have made the suggestion that the film is very reminiscent of 1930s documentary filmmaking. Mm -hmm. I, think it is, I think it's reminiscent of documentary film and documentary photography in particular. The, um, in that sense, I would say that the film is about three different historical moments. It's about 1915-16, but it's also, it also makes allusions, I think, to the Depression and the Great Depression, uh, as it's usually called, and certainly it was. Uh, as well as, as I said before, dealing with the 70s. And in terms of the 30s, uh, what our image is of the Depression, I think, uh, is almost entirely uh, a matter of, uh, of photography and, to some extent, film as well. Um, that is, the, 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 the photographs taken by the, the Farm Securities Administration photographers throughout the 30s, people like Dorothea Lange and Arthur Rothstein and... Uh, uh, Walker Evans and so forth, that those images 
have become engraved, in a sense, in our consciousness, even if uh, we don't remember any particular photograph or particular image. Our view of the 30s is very much, and of the Depression particularly, is very much um, uh, a kind of historical memory of those photographs. Those photographs, by the way, were more or less forgotten in the 40s or 50s. In a sense, uh, particularly after the Depression ended, I think there was a desire to sort of put all that aside. And it wasn't until the 60s that uh, a renewed interest in those Farm Security Administration photographers uh, uh, was exhibited. And many of these photographs were then uh, reprinted in books and, and, and given considerable uh, attention and currency. And so although I don't believe that, that necessarily the, the filmmakers of Northern Lights were consciously trying to imitate images from those 30s photographs, I think that the film does reflect a kind of awareness of that photography, uh, even if it's a subconscious uh, awareness, and that there are certain moments in the film and certain images that to me are very reminiscent of those films. And I think that that in itself is not surprising because the 30s in some ways was a replay of this period, of in terms at least of, of the, uh, the situation of the farmers of this period, 1915, 1916. And uh, there are certain scenes in the film, like the farm foreclosure scene, that is as much uh, about the Depression to me as it is about 1915, 1916. When people think of farm foreclosures, they tend to think about the 30s. And uh, I think the film encourages that association uh, between the two periods. Uh, they also tend to film, think about the 80s. And, uh, and uh, so that, that is, is perhaps not obviously part of the film's uh, consciousness, but it is part of ours. But in any case, uh, I think it's hard to make a, a film about farm life, about rural life, in a, in a difficult uh, economic moment without evoking in some way uh, the Depression. And, um, and that reinforces uh, my sense that uh, the film, one of the things the film is, is saying is that things don't change. Uh, uh, you know, things uh, were worse in the 30s than, uh, than they were perhaps in 1915, 16. And so uh, in spite of the uh, NPL, in spite of its victories, uh, these difficulties have to be dealt with again at, ver at various moments. I also think that the photography of the film, the black and white, uh, and the way Judy Arola, the cinematographer, uh, lights certain scenes and films them is very reminiscent of, uh, of 30s films like Grapes of Wrath, uh, John Ford's film. Now, Ford, of course, was very influenced by the photographs of Dorothea Lange, et cetera. So there's a kind of, of uh, uh, complex interaction there. There are a number of shots in Grapes of Wrath that come right out of some of those FSA photographs. At the same time, however, there are other kinds of photographic strategies that are part of the filmmakers of Grapes of Wrath, particularly Greg Tolan, who was a, a great cinematographer. And I think anyone who is a, uh, has studied cinematography in, uh, in America um, uh, in any period since the 1930s and 40s cannot help but be aware of Greg Tolan's work. So whether Judy Arola was consciously aware of it or not, I think she imitates some of the photographic strategies of, uh, of 30s filmmaking, and, and particularly of Greg Tolan. So that's another sort of connection. And this is true even in certain uh, interior scenes. There are a lot of uh, wonderful scenes in Grapes of Wrath that are photographed using available light, or what appears to be available light, like a gas lamp, for example. There's a, there's a, uh, there are scenes using um, a, a light from, a, from a, a wood stove and things of that uh, with, uh, with the, the flames visible. And so uh, there are a number of scenes in Northern Lights that, that use a gas lamp uh, uh, as available light for uh, photography, uh, or at least what appears to be available light. And I think those all are reminiscent of, of uh, some of the, the 30s films, as well as the 30s f uh, photography. So I, I think that's, that's one aspect of the film, anyway, that I see as, as, uh, uh, as being evident, is the relationship with the, with the Depression. Okay. I'm interested in your comments about the credits for the film in relationship to the mm. meaning of the film. You've referred to the North Dakota Collective <clears throat> Uh, involved in, in making the film. Yeah, I, I think certainly there are very few uh, films that I've seen uh, 
that have as many names uh, uh, appended at the end of it, although that's become almost a joke with even Hollywood films that the credits seem to go on forever because now everybody has to get uh, an acknowledgement, uh, you know, the caterers and uh, uh, the, uh, the people who, uh, who handle the rats and so forth in, uh, in Indiana Jones movies all get their credits. But uh, it, that wasn't as common, actually, in the uh, mid-70s. It sort of started, in a way, because of the, uh, uh, the enormous special effects in, in films that required so many people. And they all had to get credits for, for various reasons. In Northern Lights, however, the credits are really uh, an interesting aspect of it, because these are all they're listed as people who helped out in, in one way. They, they're listed, m much of the people in the credits, are really people who did not get, uh, get uh, paid for what they did. They're people who volunteered to help the filmmakers. And as the credits roll on and as you get more and more thank yous, uh, you have a sense that the film uh, ceases to be the product of a few specific individuals, but actually becomes a kind of collective uh, work of art that uh, a lot of people uh, in, in little ways as well as big ways, helped out, helped these uh, filmmakers uh, uh, produce their product. And so although the film, uh, in a sense, ends before the credits with a kind of uh, mixed feeling about the, the, the validity of collective action. I mean, Henry Martinson, although he's a very positive image, he's also speaking about events in the past. And, uh, uh, and he's making it clear that uh, I mean, at one point early in the film, he says, you know, this is the days when we had the powers that be on the run, and, and that's in the past tense. Uh, the powers that be aren't on the run anymore is the implication. So there's a kind, and the fact that Henry Martinson's an old man and uh, much of his vision has not come, come true is, is a kind of, of uh, pessimistic note, even though his own vigor and his own vitality is a, is a positive and optimistic note. Uh, nevertheless, that's not the end of the film. The credits are the end of the film. And as the credits roll on, you do have this sense of, of, of what collective activity can be and what people can do uh, if they depend on their friends and neighbors and, and even strangers uh, to, to help them out. And so uh, to me, that's really the meaning of the credits, finally, is that it, 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 this is a collective product. Do you think that's clear to the outside world? or? It's, Do people living in North Dakota understand that as a... Yeah, well, I think people living in North Dakota will recognize, of course, a number of names, you know, and that, that makes it very evident to them. Uh, but um, I, think, I think that sense comes through anyway, just the way they're, they're, they're presented and headed and, you know, uh, the, the clear sense of uh, uh, these people are not, you know, given a title. They're not... Uh, uh, grips or, uh, or or whatever, they are just listed as names of people who helped, and uh, and so I think, uh, and, and you know the fact that the North Dakota Humanities Council, a kind of uh, semi-public body, uh, financed the film and all that, uh, makes it also seem uh, like a collective product. Uh, so you know I don't know if anyone else responds to the credits the same way I do, but that that seems to be my my feeling and impression at the at the end of it, um, and uh, in fact. I know, of course, I know the names of many of the people who appear on the credits. Some of them are, are my colleagues and uh, and people I've worked with uh, here and there. So it's it's quite uh, I'm, I'm quite aware of that. Um, and I feel that uh, when the film was being distributed, uh, the one of the f film di uh, directors, John Hansen, uh, stayed in my uh, apartment for a couple of nights. So I feel that I also contributed to the uh, that collective uh, uh, aspect of the film. It's too late for my name to get on the credits, unfortunately, but. What do you think is the primary meaning and importance of the film? Is it the consideration of history, or is it the consideration of the personal? You've talked about that balance between fiction and history. Is it indeed a balance, or is there? Well, I think it attempts to be a balance. And, and certainly, uh, you know, I can imagine a, a film uh, about the NPL, a fiction film, that would take rather different contours than this one does. It's usually assumed that you have to have some kind of personal conflict in any kind of dramatic art for it to be dramatic. That is, um, to have, a, a, or at least, if not a, a personal conflict, then some sort of uh, conflict between individuals and nature, let's say, you know, of uh, uh, fighting a hurricane. Or, uh, or, but even that, even films that, uh, with that kind of subject matter, tend always to include a, a personal conflict, uh, that uh, even if it's a disaster movie, it's not just uh, a fight between 
uh, some person and some disaster. There's also subsidiary to it, uh, and maybe in fact taking over at some point, uh, some kind of conflict between individuals. And that necessity, or that perceived necessity, uh, means that um, there will be a kind of distraction away from the social historical conflict to unto the personal. I think the, the makers of Northern Lights try to balance that. And of course, they're dealing with a genuine reality. That is, insofar as uh, uh, a human being, an individual, involves him or herself with the larger world, with political, social issues, uh, to that extent, uh, they are taking energies and, and um, activities away from their private and their personal, their personal lives. Uh, I think it's unfortunate that in, in our culture uh, that distinction actually exists. I mean, ideally, I don't think there should be a, a, a distinction between the personal uh, and the political, between uh, the domestic and the larger sphere. I think that's partly a result of, uh, um, of the Industrial Revolution and of capitalism that that has developed. Uh, and I think a, a political film ideally ought to to work against that somewhat simple-minded distinction between the personal and the political. And so I think in some ways it's unfortunate that Northern Lights chooses to make that a kind of central issue. Um, uh, but again, you know, you need some sort of dramatic conflict, and uh, you need some kind of tension. What the film does is it adopts um, a kind of strategy that actually was also typical of, of 30s fiction uh, uh, and um, in film to some, some extent, and indeed of, of Hollywood fiction in general, uh, creates the reluctant hero, the, the character who early on in the film or early on in the novel uh, doesn't really want to get involved with X issue, uh, doesn't really want to uh, participate in a, uh, some movement or some political process, but through the course of the film becomes more and more pushed in that direction until finally uh, the character embraces that, that cause, uh, and then uh, and then becomes totally committed to it. Uh, that aspect is played through with with Ray Sorensen, who at first doesn't want to have anything to do with MPL. He's concerned with his own family, his own farm, and so forth. But in the course of the film, he realizes, and I think this is the the, the very positive and important part of the film. He realizes that uh, that in order to help his family or his uh, his brother or whatever that he needs to take this collective act, that he needs to join with others in a common cause for the common good. Um, but that's presented as a kind of sacrifice, and the sacrifice is on the level of the domestic. Uh, to do this, he can't really um, help his brother out when his brother needs it, uh, and even more significantly, he can't really marry his fiance because uh, uh, he does, first of all, he doesn't have the money because as a result of getting involved politically, the, there's a threat that the mortgage will be, uh, and mortgage is pulled on uh, their farm and so forth. So uh, it's as if in order to participate in a, in a large collective victory, uh, the result is personal defeat at some level. Uh, and so I think the film is, is uh, uh, it's perhaps unfortunate that it takes that kind of scheme and, and works it out. Ideally, there's no reason why uh, uh, Inga and Ray can't get married. There's no reason why Inga and Ray can't together work for uh, the the, uh, the larger uh, public good. Uh, you know, there's no. Uh, I mean, the idea is, of course, that if you get married, then you have to have children. You have to stay at home. That's you know, that's the implication. But it's not. That's not the only way to live one's life. And so, I think it's unfortunate the film suggests that that's the the only way to live live your life. Um, but I think the the other aspect of it raises a, a sort of a growing commitment to the cause, uh, which again is a cliche. I mean, a perfect example is a film like Casablanca, for example, where uh, uh, Humphrey Bogart spends most of the film saying, "No, I." I'm not interested in, in the rest of the world. I don't care about the war. All I care about is myself and so forth. And of course, eventually he ends up you know, joining the, the Free French and, and ready to fight and so forth. Well, that's a very uh, hackneyed uh, Hollywood uh, uh, device. But uh, it's a valuable one because it helps to get the audience to identify with the character. Since the implication is that since most people are selfish, they will immediately identify with selfishness. Uh, and uh, if selfishness then turns into uh, some kind of uh, uh, of desire to help other people, uh, then they can sort of go along with that as long as they were initially associated with the selfish character. So uh, that's part of where that comes from. 
But I think the film does manage to maintain a balance, and I think at the end it's open-ended. You're not quite sure whether Ray or Inge will get together. Maybe they will, uh, and uh, it's not impossible. Uh, and if they don't, well, you know, that's life, too. Uh, it's not the most uh, important thing in the world, uh, perhaps. So, uh, so the filmmakers do sort of have it both ways by the end, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, we thank you for joining us, Dr. Anderegg, and I think that gives us an interesting consideration of the fiction film as artifact, uh, specifically in Northern Lights. Thank you very much for joining us for well, conversations in North Dakota history. Thank you.